Hello, uh, I'm Christer Ulvai. I'm the CTO of Direct Conversion, and I will be presenting to you uh, the measurements we've done on the new Foresight Buttable photon counting ASIC with integrated charge sharing corrections. The outline of the talk will be start with an introduction, uh, the motivation why we want to go to this new Foresight Buttable design, uh, some results, and finally conclude. Some of you may know us from the former name of XCounter, where we started up almost 25 years ago by uh, making photon counting gaseous base detectors. Uh, then we moved over to uh, solid state, cadmium telluride, cadmium zinc telluride, changed the name to direct conversion, and in 2019 we were acquired by Varix Imaging. So in house we do uh, ASIC design, uh, so we own our own uh, ASICs, uh, not depending on anyone else. We do wafer processing, uh, not wafer manufacturing, but processing the wafers, um, flip chip pump bonding. And that means we get a, a sensor, which consists of our own ASIC uh, together with the CADTEL or CADZINCTEL direct converting material. And finally, we make uh, that into a detector module, which is, is um, shown here on, on the right. It could be a standardized module or very customized uh, OEM versions. The applications ranging from uh, food inspection, fairly low KEVs, uh, electronics inspection, dental, uh, some CT applications, uh, medical, and also uh, higher or very high energy uh, industrial inspections like wells, where we can operate at 450 KEV or even up to 1.2 MeV uh, cobalt 60 sources. And as you can tell from the name of the company, we are working with direct converting detectors. Uh, that means that we are converting the X-rays directly into charge, which we detect in our ASIC. Uh, that's in contrast to scintillator based, where the X-rays are first converted into light uh, and then detected by, uh, by the electronics. The way the detector works is that we have a semiconductor crystal. It can be cadmium telluride, cadmium zinc telluride, gallium arsenide, or pretty much any uh, suitable material. An X-ray comes in, is uh, stopped, and converts into electron hole pairs uh, in the electric field. Those are drifted towards uh, the collection electrodes, uh, where they're connected to the readout basics through bump-ons, and then uh, read out uh, in the front-end circuitry and counted if it's above a certain threshold. Now over to the motivation, why we need a photon counting foresight buttable ASIC. The current detectors that we have uh, using this hybrid of ASIC and cadmium telluride crystal that is wire bonded to a readout substrate. That means that there is an inactive area on the side uh, of the sensitive area where we cannot uh, record any, any X-ray. So this will be a dead area if we would want to make a large area detectors. So currently the biggest detectors that we have, they are 25 millimeters. Uh, so we can, in that case, make a 50 millimeter uh, wide detector. It can have arbitrary length, but we can't make it wider than, than 50 millimeters. Now, what we want to do is to get to a fully foresight buttable uh, de device, which means that we can build whatever area we would like. To achieve a foresight buttable device, uh, there needs to be space to get readouts uh, out from uh, the circuit. That can be done either with an interposer, where we have a smaller ASIC than, than the actual size of the, you know, the converter. Then we can have readouts coming out with flex cables on the sides, uh, or uh, we can have a one-to-one -one coupling where uh, one pixel couples directly to, to one other pixel on the readout basic. So the drawback of, of the interposer solution is that it adds capacitance, and it's also varying the capacitance over the area. Uh, and this has the effect on uh, the gain uh, of the chip, uh, but also some effects on the noise, which we'll come back to a bit later. It also adds one more layer of, of, of complexity. Now, in contrast, the, the direct connection, uh, all pixels have the same capacitance. It's also smaller. Uh, it does have the disadvantage of having a larger die. Uh, currently, though, uh, the majority of the cost in, in such a detector is the converter material. Uh, so we don't think that this is a big uh, drawback. 
this allows us then to make a larger uh, device uh, without gaps for the readouts. And as you can see, this one as in the center has all four sides surrounded by, by other chips. And this is then of course made possible by connecting the readouts and power through the silicon to connect the readout substrate below. And with this design, we can make, uh, as you saw on the previous slide, a module that is, is uh, larger without gaps. And of course, this 3x3 is not limited to 3x3. It could be any size, really. It can also be split into segments uh, where we have readouts on the side, which would be the case for a CT module. This can then be combined into a larger area if wanted. Uh, again, there is no limitation uh, of 3 by 3. That's just what we choose to build as a first um, module for demonstrations. And now some basics on the ASIC principle. We have a charge sensitive preamplifier that picks up the charge from the electrode. Uh, the signal is then compared to uh, the different thresholds in the comparators. And if it's exceeding a certain threshold, the counters are, are incremented uh, at the end of an acquisition or the end of a frame. That data is transferred to shift registers and read out. And while it's read out, the next frame is starting to be acquired. Now I get back to why the capacitance is an important factor in the design, apart from lowering the signal or lowering the gain uh, with the larger capacitance, there's also an effect of the noise of the front end uh, amplifiers. So the thermal noise is proportional to the square uh, of the total capacitance and also the 1 over F noise is proportional to the square. Uh, and of course, the lower we can make the, the capacitance, the lower the noise. The capacitance of the detector is the interpixel capacitance between individual pixels. It's also the anode to cathode capacitance. And also, of course, to an interposer, if there is an interposer, there is also that added capacitance uh, and also capacitance to the ASIC. So in total, a smaller pixel gives a smaller capacitance and gives a lower front end noise. The smaller pixel also means that we can use the small pixel effect, which means that a signal charge is induced close to the electrode which means that for a smaller pixel, the charge pulses are shorter. Uh, and as an example, we can see here uh, that a very small pixel gives a very short pulse in comparison to a large pixel, in this case 500 microns, the pulse is much longer. Now, these values are not absolute, they will be depend on, on the electric field and a lot of other things, but as a guideline, you can see what, what actually happens with a larger pixel. The drawback is, of course, with a larger pixel, that you will need to count faster, which means that the actual time that you have available will be much shorter. So that means that if you have a two large pixels and you have a high count rate, you will be losing part of the signal and thus energy information. So for this new ASIC design, we have selected 150 micron pixels that we can do two by two pinning on chip. Reason for the small pixels is both the count rate capabilities and the small pixel effect, etc., as, as shown before, but also to be able to build uh, flat panels, for example, for cardiac imaging. It has selectable charge sharing correction, and I'll get back to that in a minute, uh, why that is important for the small pixels. It's foresight buttable using the through silicon vias, as discussed before with six energy bins, 14-bit counters that can also be ganged into three energies with 28-bit counters if very high dynamic range is needed. We can read out at up to four gigabits per second per chip, uh, and that allows us to do 10,000 frames a second in two by two pinning mode with all six energies, or we can reduce the number of energies. For example, you can do 10,000 frames per second full rest mode with single energy. And it's capable of doing well above 10 to the 8 photons per millimeter square. Uh, and now I'll show some results on the uh, DQE and the resolution count rate, and, and, and finally show some sample images. Now to the DQE without charge sharing correction turned on. Uh, this is with 0.75 millimeter cantile thickness, which uh, is not the optimum for an RQA9 spectra, but what we had in hand and, and what we've been trying this out with. It still got a pretty high DQE of zero, close to 80%. Uh, but what I want you to pay attention to is the noise power spectrum, which is falling off, uh, like you see on, on, on the upper right here. What you would expect from an uncorrelated pixel matrix 
is a totally flat uh, NPS. So that means that what we see here is charge sharing between pixels. It means that one single X-ray incoming on higher frequencies is generating more than, than, than one pulse. So if we look at the charge sharing and the effect that that has uh, on the output uh, is that we can have, of course, in the ideal case, uh, an X-ray coming in and generating all the charge in, in the center of one pixel. But it could also be in between two pixels generating one count in uh, two pixels. <clears throat> Depending on the threshold, it could also be zero counts in, in both of those pixels. And then in that case, the charge would be completely missed, which is not good. There's also quite a bit of interaction inside the converter itself. In this example, a 60 keV photon uh, has the pretty high probability of, of photoelectric uh, effect. And out of that uh, high probability of characteristic X-ray generation, which means that a new X-ray is sent out uh, from that interaction point uh, with the energy of 23 or 27 keV, depending on if it's from the cathode or tellurium atom. Attenuation length of this new photon is in the range of 70 microns, uh, which means that you can hit uh, a pixel close to the center, but still generate this signal pretty far out uh, on the neighbor pixel. So we could end up with the case where we have a primary interaction in between two pixels in this example, and then a key escape uh, that escapes out to another pixel and generates a signal there. So in this case, it would be a quite blurred uh, response. So what we do to correct for this, we sum the charge from the neighbor pixels and we only allow uh, the pixel with the highest charge to count. So that would give us the results of, of uh, only one pixel triggering and having also the correct energy in, in that pixel. So in this slide, you can see the effect that the charge sharing correction has on, uh, on the MTF. So we can see a distinct increase on, on the MTF with the charge sharing correction turned on. Uh, you can see on the noise power spectrum that is now more flat, which means that we don't have the correlations uh, between uh, the neighbor pixels. Uh, and then finally, you can see the effect total of this has on, on the DQE. So the DQE difference wasn't that high, but there is a big difference in energy resolution. Uh, in this case, it's with an Ameritium 241 source, and you can see that it has a very good uh, energy resolution of, in this case, measured 7.2 keV. So the charge sharing correction is very good for position resolution and for energy resolution. Now that comes at a cost. And the cost in this case is the count rate, maximum count rate capability. In this graph, you see the maximum or the output count rate versus the input count rate for the case without charge sharing correction in black and with charge sharing correction in red. And if you fit the curves uh, to a parallelizable model, uh, you get a dead time of 41 nanosecond for the non charge corrected uh, option and 117 nanoseconds for the charge corrected option. So the effect at very high fluxes is that we get pulse pileup, and that means that small pulses may be counted as larger pulses, or two large small pulses combined into one larger pulse. As you can see on uh, on this graph here, with the charge sharing correction, uh, cerium filtered beam, you get a nice separation of, of uh, from the K edge of, of cerium as the input increases. You can see that more and more of the low energies are shifted towards the higher energies. And in this case, it's a 90 keV. So there is no actual uh, photons that have uh, energies about 90 keV. This is what simulated spectra looks like. So you can see it, it matches very well at low energies or at low fluxes, but at higher fluxes, you start to distort the spectra. If you look at the case with the uh, non-charge corrected, uh, you can see that that has much less uh, effect uh, on the higher flux. So there is less pulse pileup, but on the other hand, you have much less uh, energy resolution. In very high flux regions where there is significant pulse pileup, it's also important to linearize the data. And in this example, I show an edge spread function from an MTF measurement taken here at uh, quite low uh, input flux. 
but did we move to a very high input flux instead where we are in the raw beam on the slope going down it means that once we start covering up a little bit more uh, of the pixel the input rate on that pixel is reduced but in fact the output rate is then increased because we are climbing up the curve here and that gives effect of, of um, an overshoot of, of the edge spread function so unless uh, you linearize this this will give effect of, of, a, of a very strange looking mtf curve so if we look at some sample images, uh, in this case, it's a line pair phantom scanned at one and a half meters per second, uh, imaged at 2000 frames per second, 4000 frames per second, and 10,000 frames per second. And as you may appreciate, uh, the sharpness is of course much better in 10,000 frames per second. Uh, the 150 micron pixel means that it is moving one pixel per frame, while it's of course a lot blurrier on, on the lower frame rates. So this is an example from this 3x3 module I showed the picture of before. Uh, it's a stack of ceramic plates with some bit of tungsten powder in between that is shot with an air gun at 80 meters per second output, uh, 10,000 frames per second. Uh, there is some artifacts in the image up, up here, which is uh, due to some bad tiles on, on this device. Uh, but you can appreciate that there is no gaps in, in the image, uh, so it really shows the foresight compatibility and uh, the speed capabilities of this detector. So in conclusions, we have demonstrated the foresight compatibility of this new device. We have shown that we can do images at uh, 1000 frames per second. Uh, we can show that charge sharing correction is really important for small pixels to get good energy resolution and that we can achieve count rates well in the buffer of 10 to the 8 photos per millimeter square and with that i'd like to thank you for your attention